Good evening. I'd like to just sort of give you a rough idea how we're going to do this tonight. The presentation is in three parts. The very first part, we'll talk about last year's budget and what we would, uh, what we committed to do for the county if they supported the millage rate. And then the second chart will be what I'm asking the board to support this year uh, in the July vote. And then the third part is probably going to be the one of the longest discussion. We'll talk about transit and transportation, which is all over the news right now. And then we have some charts here that we'll be using during the presentation. And if, if you haven't seen them before, please uh, stay afterwards and take a look at them. So the first chart, this is what you saw last year at the town halls. And I'll just like to sort of go over it, uh, what our commitments were. On the public safety side, we committed $15 million. Seven and a half million went to the sheriff and seven and a half went to the police. So I'm just going to talk about the police because they work for the county, whereas the sheriff is an independent uh, elected official. And he, we give him his budget, but he spends it as he chooses. But he does good stuff with it. We uh, had enough funding to buy some more police officers. Doesn't buy all the ones that we want. Uh, but we're going to make you know, inroads a little bit at a time because this is a line item that will be in every budget from here on out. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, you know, increase the number of officers we have, although retirement's always a factor. A body, cameras for everybody, almost everybody. Uh, that's to protect both the police officer and the, um, and the public at a traffic stop. The only challenge this year is that our vendor for our body cameras is uh, decided to go out of business. We've got to find another vendor this year. Animal services, the reason we put that up there is that that was the fleet of vehicles that had the most miles of any of the cars we had in Cobb County. Some had over 300,000 miles on them. They were way out of service warranty. And then Sheriff Warren is committed to providing uh, appropriate medical and dental services to all his inmates. Uh, this is an uh, area that's always under public scrutiny, federal scrutiny, so we've got to make sure that we uh, provide all our inmates in the jail with the necessary medical and dental treatment while they're there so we don't run into the, any trouble with the, with the state or the federal government. And quite honestly, it's the right thing to do. In the center part, the transportation, um, every county, I mean, every before the recession, every commissioner had a four-person team to take care of mowing the grass, picking up garbage, and uh, filling potholes. And during the recession, we went from four teams in the county down to one. And this part of the funding restores every commissioner has a four-person team now. So what we're asking you is if you have a problem uh, in your area, you have a pothole, or you, you think the grass has gone too high, or you want us to pick up garbage, just call your commissioner, and they'll send one of these teams out there to take care of it. So we'd like you to be our eyes and ears. And then we had a number of other vehicles in DOT that were way out of service warranty, and uh, we, needed to re we needed to replace them, you know, trucks, uh, equi specialized equipment of that, of that kind. Libraries, everybody knows I'm a big supporter of libraries. So with that money, we now, every library in the county is open six days a week, and our regional libraries will be uh, open on Sundays. And then I'll show you what we're going to do with next year's budget if the board approves it. Other expenses, we are on a uh, schedule of, with our Raiders in New York to replenish our pension plan to take it to 100%. It's kind of like a mortgage payment. We're on a 30-year plan. And we have to pay a certain amount of money every year into this pension plan to make sure that we're meeting the criteria established by our Raiders. And that's what most of that $10 million is for that. And then last week, the board approved another couple million dollars to uh, make the make the uh, pension plan hold. But we're we're far away from that. We're about 54 percent funded. It's not it's not it's not the best. It's not where we want to be, but we're getting there. And the most important thing is our Raiders in New York understand what we're doing, and they see our commitment to that. So they're uh, they're fine with it for right now as long as we meet that schedule. Vehicle replacement, five million of that, 8.6 million is to buy police cars. We bought 100 police cars with that, uh, $25,000 for the police car and $25,000 for all the uh, specialized equipment that goes inside it to make sure that when they show up at your door, they're, they're ready to go. The unified court management system, uh, we have a system now that's severely out of date. 
And uh, basically what that is is that when a judge makes a decision, if he hands out a warrant, uh, issues a warrant, this is connected to our system in the police car so that they pull you over and they pull up your license tag or your driver's license and you have a warrant against you, we can, they can arrest you. And we've had some cases where a uh, judge vacated a, a warrant, but it didn't get into the system, so he arrested somebody, and you know what a false arrest costs you. So we have to replace this system. And this is a down payment on a system that will take us about three or four years to uh, implement, but it's about a 10 or $12 million system. Very expensive. Cap replacement, it's a fancy term for replacing things like furniture, computers, uh, things of that nature. The nonprofits, this will be the last year you see that line item. Uh, the board will no longer be providing funding for nonprofits. And the accountability courts, those are, uh, we have several specialized programs here in the county where we, we take people that um, we believe uh, have, can do a better thing with their life and we, we um, put them into a program where every week they meet a judge and they have certain criteria, they have to meet milestones. And as long as they meet these milestones, then the judge will, you know, let them continue the program. And at the end, they come out of this program sober, uh, drug-free, uh, maybe they have a mental health issue that's been stabilized, and we restore them back to, uh, to their normal life with dignity, and most of them end up coming out with a job. So. $500,000 seems like a lot of money, but I can assure you that if we didn't have these courts, we would be leaving them in jail, and the $500,000 would be a drop in the bucket to keep them all in jail, because these, there's probably close to two or 300 people in our Calvary court system right now. And then the ongoing costs on the right side, most of those are public safety programs. So that's what we committed to last summer, and we're well on our way to funding most of those or uh, issuing contracts on them, or having them in the planning stage. So next summer, what I'm asking the board to uh, approve is, first of all, no millage increase. And that, of course, applies to your general fund portion of your taxes. Uh, so if you go and you get your tax bill, it's broken down into four parts. General fund, parks bond, uh, fire fund, and the school tax. So for the general fund portion of your taxes, there will be no increase in your tax this year. Um, and the other ones, because on that case, not moreover, those are the part of your taxes that ex qualify for the homestead exemption. So um, the only way that goes up and down is if we raise or lower the millage rate. So that'll stay the same compared to your tax bill from last year. The other ones will probably go up, well, two of them will probably go up a little bit, the uh, fire fund and the uh, parks bond, because those are assessed against the most recent appraised value of your home. And uh, the fourth one is the school tax, depending on whether or not you qualify for that or not. So what are we gonna get for our money this year? Uh, the county employees have not had a pay raise in five years. So we're asking for a 3% uh, cost of living allowance or pay raise. We still have to start determining what the category is gonna be. But that $7.2 million is for roughly 4,500 people. And that pays for everybody uh, in the county, regardless of what elected office they're in. A reduction in the water fund transfer, as you know right now, we transfer $2.35 million every year. Um, well, actually more than that. How much is that, Bill? Bill Volkman here? It's, it's a pretty significant amount of money. We transfer money out of uh, the water fund to the general fund, and that, while that keeps your millage rate low, what it does is it takes money out of the water fund to address problems and operations in the water system. In this county here, the water system, even though it's part of the county, it's an enterprise system, so it's separately operated, receives its own funding. But we've been taking money out of there because they've been so successful in operating their, their enterprise. But what that does is that takes money away from them they can use for operating maintenance, for, for repairs like stormwater pipes, things of that nature. And we're going to start now reducing that transfer from 10% down to a number much lower than that. And this is the first year uh, of that uh, of that commitment to reduce the amount of water trend transfer. Uh, we'll restore library hours to uh, Sunday hours to every library in the county will be open seven days a week uh, with, this, with, this, with this amount of money. And the public health funding side, we have uh, two major 
uh, health crises in the county right now. One of them is opioids. And we're joining with the state in providing funding to public health to, uh, to address this very significant issue. Uh, we still have a large number of people dying in Cobb County from that. They're just dying from different things involved with the opioid crisis. Uh, I think the doctors have finally gotten the message that they're over-prescribing opioid prescriptions. So these people that have been using them are having a harder time finding them. So they're going to alternative drugs like fentanyl or heroin. So they're still dying in the same number. They're just dying from different things. So we're, we're going to be using uh, some of that $500,000 to partner with other public health and state agencies to expand our effort to address this issue. And then the needle natal issue is a concern of ours is that Georgia leads the country in needle natal deaths. So we'll be working with the state also in partnering to let mothers know in this county that regardless of your circumstances, we want you to have a, uh, a good birth and we want to take care of you after that birth, make sure that both of you, uh, you know, have a life and then that will transfer you into another program after that. And then the last one is the elimination of the senior fees. Uh, so that's, that's all we're asking for this year. It's pretty simple compared to last year. All right. SPLOST. SPLOST are special purpose local option sales tax. That's the uh, special provision we have that allows us to ask permission for and uh, at a referendum voters approve a one cent sales tax where we buy capital and items uh, with this money. And by that I mean things like we pave our roads in the county with that money, we uh, build buildings in that county with that money, we do major intersection improvements with that, with that money, we do um, uh, overpasses at major intersections with that money. There's lots of all kinds of things we do with that, with that money. This will be our fourth consecutive SPLOS if this is passed. And the reason we're asking for it to start so early is, is that the current SPLOST that we're in right now, the 2016 SPLOST, that will terminate on December 31st, 2021. And the mayors have asked us to, con to consider extending that SPLOST because that's how they buy most of their capital programs in their cities. And of course, we have some programs in SPLOST, like paving, that if we didn't, use, if we didn't have SPLOST to pay for it, we would have to pay for it out of the general fund. And at about 35 to $40 million a year, uh, that's easily about 1.3 or 1.4 mil additional increase. So the sales tax offsets that, and it pays for uh, a great number of programs. We get about $140 million a year from SPLOST. And the SPLOST Oversight Committee, which is uh, 20 members of the community, make sure every month they look at all these projects to make sure that we're spending this money appropriately and the projects are on budget and on time. So what we're looking at here, this is the timeline that we'll be coming to you asking you to consider a renewal of the SPLOST. And I do mean re consider renewing it. This will be your decision if you want to renew it or not. And these various public hearings and town halls and public uh, uh, other public venture uh, opportunities will be your, your time to tell us how you feel about it and if you do want to redo it, what kind of projects do you want to put in the next SPLOST? Uh, the only thing I want to emphasize is that I'm not in favor of renewing a six-year SPLOST. I just think that's too long. The mayors want a five-year SPLOST, and I'm, I'm, willing to, uh, I'm willing to support that. But certainly no longer than five years, because it's really hard to plan something actually that's seven years out and have a reasonable idea what that's going to cost because part of the list that we're going to present to you will have an estimated cost for that project and that's just really really tough to estimate a cost seven years out for a program so what will happen is in may of next year you'll have a list uh, and the wording of the referendum that we'll put on the ballot in 2020 if you decide that you want to renew this lost okay and these are it's the rough categories of what involves the SPLOST here. So when it says right there the referendum includes SPLOST purposes, not project specifics, I can assure you that, you that the referendum language will be tied to a specific project list. So when we put that, obviously we can't put that every single project on the referendum. They would take up the whole ballot. But you will know for sure what it is you're voting on to various, you know, uh, 
mediums of uh, informing you what those project lists are. And the bottom one is the important line, is that uh, we will approve the project list before we put it on, on the ballot, and you will know what then that project list will be something that you've committed to us that you want to do. All right, so let's get into the third part of the presentation now, which talks about transit and transportation. And I just sort of want to go over the three tools that we were going to do. We already used two of them, and a third one will be coming here in the next month of how we are going to be identifying transit and transportation projects that will address our needs here in the, in the county with regard to transit and transportation. And the first one we did was the transit study. And the study was this, uh, a board approved in 2017 to look at the current bus system, Coblink, and what is it we can do with that current system to make it better, uh, to modify it, revise it, to enhance it, make it more efficient. And I just want to make a couple, uh, emphasize a couple things about the Coblink system. First of all, it has been around for 30 years. This year's is 30th anniversary. And so it is a tried and true system. Second of all, it carries 3.5 million riders a year. So it is not a lightly used system. And I'm well aware of people saying that buses ride around empty all day long. And I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. You know, they don't ride around all day long. Because in the morning and the evening, they're packed. But it's a sunk cost. Whether you ride the bus, whether you operate a bus, you know, a certain amount of time, you can't be asking bus drivers to come into work for three hours and then leave for eight hours and come back through, you know, for another three hours. So it's a system that has a cost built into it. Secondly, the buses that we use are buses that we got from the federal government for free. So they're one size. And if we want to give these buses back, we have to reimburse them for the whole amount of the bus, no matter how long you use them. So if we do not meet the mileage and the year requirements on these buses, we have to reimburse the federal government $500,000 per bus. So either way, it's going to cost us. So we keep the buses, we put them in the system, and then we did this study to make sure that uh, we, we're using the system as, uh, as best that we can, given the needs of the ridership. And on Tuesday, the board will be looking at several recommendations from the study to, to, uh, to make the system more efficient. Uh, I want to also emphasize that 70% of the riders on this system use it to get to work. They need it to get to work. Um, if, they didn't, if they didn't have this bus, they would not get to work. And that would have all kinds of economic uh, and other uh, implications throughout the system for the county. So there's always a cost benefit, and I realize that we have to subsidize this. But I believe in the long run, by getting these people to work, they return their money back into our, uh, into our economy that pays the taxes that allow us to offset the subsidy. The only thing I want to point on here is this TNC. Uh, that's really a fancy term for uh, Lyft or Uber. Right now we have a system down in uh, part of the county called Flex, and it's a very expensive system. It was brought in to replace a, uh, a, a, a bus routes that we lost during the recession. Uh, and we were given a cost of what it would, 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 would cost us to operate this bus, and it turned out to be much higher than we thought. It's about 40 to $50 a rider. So we believe that we can replace that system and make it even better by expanding the service area, uh, providing vouchers for Uber or Lyft, and give these people more opportunity to get connected to a bus system in a more responsive fashion. Because with Uber and Lyft, you can call them anytime you want, and they'll take you to, uh, to a uh, specific area on the system. And it might cost you a little bit more, but it gives you more flexibility in your life rather than have to wait an hour and a half or two hours for the flex bus to show up. So the transit study is one tool that we have. The next tool we had is the famous transit and transportation survey. And that's the uh, phone poll we did after Thanksgiving, asking people in the county what they thought that the future needs were for transit and transportation in Cobb County and what they'd be willing to pay for it. And what this uh, survey did was is it allowed us to break the county down into sections. Uh, this map just shows you some of the sub-districts we have, but we can break these districts down into even smaller areas. And if you were to go and ask our uh, resident expert here on the survey to come and give you a presentation, 
they could tell you within a mile of where you lived how your neighbors felt about the transit system, what their transportation needs are, and what they'd be willing to support in the future. So we're going to take these two tools, the transit study and the transit survey, and we're going to use them uh, in the uh, implementation of the next tool, which is the transportation, uh, the Cobb, uh, tra Cobb transportation plan, comprehensive transportation plan update. And that's a revision that we do every uh, five years, right? And then we do a big, big look at every 10 years. So we're doing the big look now. And with that, I'm going to bring up Eric to talk about that part of the plan. So Eric Meyer here is from our DOT. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Meyer. I'm with Cobb County Department of Transportation. So we're going to give a little bit of a transit and transportation update. Um, as the Chairman talked about, we will be uh, beginning our comprehensive transportation plan this April. Uh, we're going to conduct about nine meetings um, to start out with. We'll also be out there at Taste of Marietta, Taste of East Cobb, a lot of other events. So look for us out there. What is a comprehensive transportation plan? So as the chairman says, we do these every five years. Um, this is a bigger dive than usual. There's a bigger transit element than we've usually done. Um, we look all the way out to 2050. So Cobb today is around 750,000 folks. By 2050, we're projected to be close to a million. So that's a big increase. What do we do with almost 250,000 more people in Cobb by 2050? We then work our way back to 2040, 2030, and then focus, what would we do with the next SPLOST? So it's, we look long and then come back and focus on what projects make sense for you all in the next BLAST. We're going to cover some other terms that uh, we'll be talking about over the next two years, sort of to make sure we're all on the same page. Bottlenecks. Um, I saw some of you all coming up and looking at this bottleneck map. This is for the entire county. Um, this really looks at um, where are the places that it's toughest that you're most likely to sit in traffic at an intersection. So this is an intersection-focused set of metrics. You know, where are most folks sitting for the longest time and the most number of days per year? Uh, up there on the slide, that's for District 1 and the top 40 bottlenecks there. Level of service. We use level of service mostly looking at roadway segments. So just like with your Google Maps app, green is good. Green means you're moving along about the speed limit. Red is bad. So what this does is this tells us during the AM peak, the morning peak, these are some roads in District 1 that we know from the data we look at are pretty lousy in the morning. Obviously, we're going to be talking to you all at these meetings. Um, we're going to be looking at other data sources and trying to see, is this technical analysis right? What are you seeing out there? What do you want to see done? So what do we do um, to improve the situation that's both good for transportation and good for the community that those road projects are in? A project, we're, a project type we're likely to discuss in this next CTP update is something called grade separations. Uh, basically, this is one road going over the other or one going under the other. Um, the issue here is, you know, Cobb has some pretty major roads like Cobb Parkway, Windy Hill, Barrett, Stylesboro, Roswell Road, you name it. And there's only so much sometimes we can do at these intersections to have double lefts, triple lefts, you name it and still move people through these bottlenecks that are on the map. So we'll probably be looking in this next BLOST at some locations where a grade separation might make sense. They're expensive projects, so we need to have a full conversation about this to see if it's worth it. On the transit side, some terms we'll be using uh, include heavy rail. Uh, we have a picture of MARTA up here, just because it's probably the most familiar picture of heavy rail uh, for folks who live around here. But you could think of uh, the subway in New York, the rail lines in Washington, D.C. Heavy rail um, is heavy because the tracker, track is heavier, the train system is heavier. Generally, they're known for carrying more passengers per hour than a light rail or other types of technology. Light rail, so by comparison, typically um, also called streetcar in some cases. We have that in downtown Atlanta. Um, other places have this, like Portland, San Francisco. There are lots of other places that have light rail, so this will be part of the conversation. Bus rapid transit, or BRT, or some folks call it uh, rubber tire rail. We'll be discussing that. Um, what bus rapid transit tries to do is mimic the experience of light rail, but to use a rubber tire vehicle in its own lane. So you can see that's in its bus only lane. We try to have more attractive stations, not just bus stops with a little stick in the ground and a sign. So we'll be discussing bus rapid transit. 
And so those are some of the big terms we'll be kicking around. Um, those are just a few. Uh, folks like me, we have books of fun terms, so we will not go into more of those. I've been directed not to get too technical. <laughs> so we're also going to be talking about not just what projects we think make sense for Cobb County's transportation system, but how might we finance those things. For transit, we could continue financing transit through our general fund. Um, our current budget for Cobb Link is around $23 million a year. Uh, as the chairman says, we've been in operation for 30 years. So we have a respectable suburban system. If we want to increase it, do we continue to go into the general fund? That's always tricky. Do we join MARTA under existing statute? It seems that if Cobb wanted to do that, we might have already done that. So that's probably not a likely option, but it is an option. We could contract with MARTA. There actually is an opportunity you could pay MARTA for service, but not join MARTA. It's a, it may be splitting hairs. The other option is under House Bill 930, which passed last year and was signed by the governor, uh, Cobb County has the option to um, put before the voters a referendum to have a full or fractional penny sales tax for transit, and that would fund an expansion of Cobb Link if we so chose. And again, we can scale it to what we need. We could have a sales tax that just covers what we do today, so we take transit off the general fund, or we could say we need a little bit more. We need buses to Ackworth. East Cobb needs service again. So we could scale that amount of sales tax to whatever the public ends up thinking makes sense. For roads, fairly similar. Uh, today, our road projects are funded with SPLOST, and then we usually try to match that up with federal and state dollars. But there are zero dollars from the general fund that go into resurfacing or major road projects. Um, our general fund covers cutting the grass and dealing with potholes, but no resurfacing of major roads or any intersection improvements. So we'll see what the 2022 SPLOS looks like and whether the voters have an, ap have an appetite for it. Um, the other option is something called a T-SPLOST. I know that gets that, ooh, that's, no one likes hearing that. Um, back in 2012, there was a regional T-SPLOST. It went down in flames, uh, not popular. The chairman does a much better version of that story. I wasn't living here at the time. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, but I moved to another city for a time. So, but you're allowed to do a county-only T-SPLOS. So this wouldn't be a regional uh, sales tax option. This would just be for the county. So we could explore, again, whether if certain road projects that we all agreed we needed um, didn't make it on the 2022 SPLOS, do we add some projects onto another list and fund that with a partial penny sales tax for just roads? And finally, as I mentioned, we could also fund road improvements with the general fund through bonds, uh, through a bond or an annual line item, or some combination of all the above, or keep on rocking the way we've been going. Okay, so wrapping up, uh, we're at the town halls today, town halls 2019. We'll be having a series of public meetings in April and May on the comprehensive transportation plan. Again, we'll be out at public events. Um, if you've got a, a group, a neighborhood group, or Rotary Kiwanis, you think you want to engage in this, give us a call. We'll be there. Um, we'll then be taking some time during the rest of 2019 to look at all that input we received, look at some of the technical information, and prepare what we think we're going to bring to the public in 2020 on SPLOST. So we'll be coming back to you all in the first quarter of 2020 and seeing if we listened, seeing if we got a good project list. Um, you'll let us know what we got right, what we got wrong, and then the board will deliberate on whether they choose to put a SPLOST on the ballot in 2020. And after that, we hope to adopt the CTP in 2021. There's the list of nine uh, CTP meetings coming up in April and May. These will be taking place at 7 p.m. with the exception of April 18th at the East Cobb Library. We'll be at 6.30. So um, we've got some flyers in the back. Uh, please pick them up. We'll be putting them up, putting it out on the website and probably pushing it out on social media. So look for that. Um, these are gonna be some fairly uh, interactive events. We're going to spend a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting explaining what we're up to, but then you're going to be at tabletops uh, with maps sort of pointing out where there are safety issues, where you think the traffic problems are, where you think the trail network needs to connect, all the above. So we hope to see you there. And with that, I will hand it back to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. 
So the, in the back of the room, we have these um, push cards that have the addresses of your commissioner and their offices, their emails. We ask you to pick one up. And uh, remember, I was talking about the, um, the new service we have where you all have right away mowing teams and things of that nature, pothole teams. This is how you get a hold of your commissioner let us know what your problem are. We, we really count on you to review the eyes and ears in many different ways um, to make sure this kind of continues to provide the five-star service you're accustomed to. So believe it or not, that's the whole presentation. We just want to give you a, a brief taste of where we're going and both on the, the budget and on some transportation issues. Uh, we, we really want you to be involved in the comprehensive transportation plan though because out of the CTP are going to come the projects that are going to go in the referendum in 2022. And the reason we decided to go that far down the road is a number of the board members uh, were concerned about having to foot a four hundred dollars to $500,000 bill for a special election in 2021. And also the perception that by doing this election in an off year, which 2021 is, we'd be gaming the system, trying to get people to the polls that were going to support it and everybody else would stay home. So by leaving the referendum in 2020, and in 2022, on the general election, we get the max number of voters to the polls, and that's a true measure of whether or not these referendums will be supported. But if we do our job right, and we've listened to you correctly in these various public hearings and town halls, everything we put in the referendum, we have validated this with you, uh, and we've come back to ask you to make sure that we heard you correctly. So when you go, do go to vote on them in the, in the referendum, whatever one it is, uh, it's just part of a process where you're comfortable that we're all doing this together.